Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. Recently, I was gifted a copy of Masters of the Universe Battleground by my family. And let me tell you, it's right up my street. A skirmish level miniatures game with a fantastic theme that makes me want to own everything Archon Studio releases for it. So naturally, when they announced the Wave 1 expansions, I pre-ordered immediately. These expansions are character packs comprising two new characters for one of the existing factions with some new terrain elements and equipment cards. One pack is for the Evil Warriors, featuring Scare, Glow and Beastman, while the other is for the Masters of the Universe, featuring Teela and the Sorceress. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the Evil Warriors pack, but just before we do, I wanted to quickly mention the pre-order incentive. I ordered direct from Archon Studios. This worked out incredibly expensive with the postage from overseas via FedEx, but it meant I got this set of limited edition plastic mana tokens with my order. As you can see, they come in their own little box and they are on a frame just like the miniatures, and they're pretty nice. Decent size, really chunky actually, and when I saw the image of them I thought they might be hard to read, but they're very clear. You get 10 1 mana tokens and 5 3 mana tokens. Unfortunately, that's really not quite enough to cover mana for two teams. That doesn't surprise me, this is one of those tournament games where you're supposed to go to organised events armed with only the stuff you need for your own use, but I'm only ever going to be playing this with friends and family, and I will be providing everything myself, so I would have liked enough tokens to make sure two players had enough. A second frame in the box would have been ideal. Of course, there are mana tokens in the core game, but they're made of cardboard, and something floats in my brain incorrectly at the idea of one person using plastic while one uses cardboard. But that aside, they're cool. Do I think they are worth paying so much postage to get them? Not really. Would I feel I was missing out on something if I didn't have them? Not really. Am I going to use them? You better believe it, and now I want the plastic health tokens too. But enough about the tokens, let's get down to the real business. This is our first Wave 1 expansion, Terror and Wildness. Comes in a flimsy tuck box, but the artwork features spot gloss on the characters and new scenery elements, which is a nice touch. I was sort of hoping I might be able to convert the expansion boxes into miniature storage for my different teams, but that's probably not going to be possible. So I will be once again using my tried and trusted magnetic storage solution for all of these miniatures. If we look at the back of the box, we see we are getting Scareglow, Beastman, two teleporters, a rule sheet, building instructions, and 16 playing cards. Let's take a closer look. Here's the plastic goodness. Just a single frame, all in the same purple as the Evil Warriors miniatures from the core set. There are the two teleports, two different sculpts, which wasn't necessary, but is certainly nice to see. The characters get sculpted bases, a wilderness theme for Beastman, while Scareglow has swirling mist around his feet. The miniatures look nicely detailed, and I don't see any visible damage on them. Beastman is in five parts, including his base. Scareglow is in six. I will be putting them together later in the video, but for now, let's move on to the new rules leaflet. This same leaflet appears in both Wave 1 expansions and covers the rules for teleporters and force fields, as well as a few FAQs regarding new cards. The teleporters are simple enough. Once they are active, every space adjacent to a teleporter is also adjacent to any other teleporter. They can be targeted with attacks, and they have 1 health, 0 toughness, and 0 mind, so they're pretty easy to destroy. I'll talk about the force fields in my other video. Finally, we have our 16 new cards, and I guess I'm in two minds about this. On the one hand, I'm really pleased they have included the character cards and the cards for the unique weapons those characters have, and I'm also pleased to see a selection of new items, weapons, fate, and even glory cards. New cards means new options when you're building your force, and that's never a bad thing. But this approach to expansions does have a downside, at least for people who want official versions of every card. It means you have to buy every expansion that comes out if you want to have every build option available. At the moment, there is no official way to get printouts of all the cards to make them yourself at home. Maybe Archon Studio will add that to their website eventually. So at the moment, people may end up buying a whole expansion just for one or two cards they need. Remember, after all, this is supposed to be a game where organised play at tournaments is a big thing, and there will be lots of players trying to keep up with the meta. Fortunately, I don't think this is a major issue for several reasons. Firstly, you get a decent amount of extra cards in each expansion. If you set aside the characters and their unique items, you still get 12 new cards to play with. Second, even if you aren't interested in the characters in the box, you get some cool new terrain elements. Thirdly, this is the Masters of the Universe, 
I think people who love this IP are going to want to buy every expansion regardless. I know I do. Finally, the expansions aren't that expensive. Most places seem to be stocking them for around £15 in the UK. Looking at the cards in more detail, first we have Scareglow and he's a bit of an odd duck. Looking at his special abilities, he has a sort of gimmick and I believe the intention is you're supposed to build your whole force and fate deck around that gimmick. That gimmick being, he's a bit creepy and he doesn't care who he spooks. As you can see, he has the special ability Nightmare, which targets an ally. If it's successful, the ally gains a curse debuff and Scareglow gets a free move action. He also has a passive ability called Fearsome Presence. Any character, any character, not just enemies, ending their activation or interruption within two hexes of Scareglow risks gaining a curse token. In other words, Scareglow is chucking out curses left and right without discrimination. It sounds like something you really don't want happening, as removing a curse token from someone inflicts a wound and constantly wounding your own troops doesn't seem particularly smart. However, it is possible to work these bizarre abilities into your strategy, as we will see when we look at Beastman and some of the cards in this expansion. Scareglow's unique weapon is the Scythe of Doom. If the target has any kind of debuff, you remove the debuff and add two dice to your attack. If you roll three or five successes, you curse the target as well as inflicting damage. It's pretty cool and obviously works well in conjunction with Scareglow's ability to curse people. Next up, we have Beastman who is, well, he's a berserker basically. Anybody who likes to play super aggressively is going to want this furball on their team. His Primal Rage ability grants him one mana token on activation if he has at least one wound, or one mana token and one whole extra action point if he has at least three wounds. And even though you want him to pick up a few wounds, his Supernatural Endurance ability should keep him in the fight for a long time, as if you are going to suffer at least two wounds, you can spend one mana point to reduce the damage by one. He comes with a whip that allows him to spend two mana tokens to take another attack action if he's already made a melee attack in the current round. So with his ability to generate extra mana and actions, he can become a whirling dervish of destruction. He teams up well with Scareglow because if he does pick up a curse from Scareglow at some point, it's just going to make him angrier and your opponents won't like him when he's angry. The pack includes four new weapons. There's the Mega Blaster, which is so big and heavy you have to take a strength test to see how accurate you're going to be with it. There's the Magic Attack Ray of Destruction, which can only target engaged opponents and is more effective against injured targets. And then we get two weapons that are clearly going to be useful if Scareglow is around. There is the Magic Spell Fatal Flaw, which only targets enemies with a debuff. And while it has a very low damage output, it's great for loading up on mana. Then we have the Skull Weapon, which has the interesting trait of passing your own debuffs to your target. So, for example, Scareglow could curse Beastman to get a free move action. Beastman could then attack with the Skull Weapon and pass that curse to his opponent. A neat little combo. We also have four new items. The Armor Cloak of Doom, which boosts your defense test by one dice if an ally within six inches has a debuff, making it another great option for Scareglow. Then there's a belt that's ideal for Beastman as it boosts strength by one if you have at least two wounds. There's a teleporter, which you discard to place two teleporters on the battlefield, and that's how you introduce those special new terrain elements. Finally, you have Shin Guards, which says attacks gain plus one dice but cannot deal more than one wound. And this highlights one of my biggest issues with this game. Some of the cards just aren't quite as clear as I would like them to be. Does this card mean attacks from the wearer are at plus one dice, or attacks against the wearer are at plus one dice? I assumed the latter. You are wearing extra armor that slows you down, making you easier to hit, but also making you more resilient. But a confirmation from the game's designer is that it's actually the former. The wearer of the Shin Guards gets an extra attack dice, but inflicts less damage, which doesn't really make any sense to me. Regardless of the rule, it's not clear enough from that wording, and if they want this game to be a big success on the tournament scene, crystal clear wording on every rule is essential. Finally, the expansion includes three new fate cards. One is insane, as it gives you four actions and one mana, but also inflicts one wound. Drop that on Beastman and your opponent is in for a bad day. There is a fate card that rewards you with free movement if you have at least three wounds, another good Beastman option, and then there is a fate card that gives you a boost on all tests if you have a debuff. Obviously a good card to drop in the deck when Scareglow comes out to play. The final card is a glory card that rewards 10 victory points if at least three characters have debuffs. 
that's easy money for Scareglow, but you have to weigh up whether you are happy to have an easy to achieve glory card that only grants 10 victory points, or whether you would rather take a card that rewards 20 or 30 points if you manage to pull it off. Decisions, decisions. Now, there does seem to be one major omission here, something I would have expected to see in the included rules leaflet. Well, on the cards really, but that ship has sailed. It's the points costs. Nowhere in this box is there a list of how many points it costs to add these characters or any of these new cards to your force. That information is available online and I will include the link in the video description below, but still, I really think that should be included in the box. For the record, Scareglow is 17 points and his Scythe of Doom is 2 points for a total of 19, while Beastman is 19 points and his Whip is 2 points for a total of 21, which is pretty high considering you can add He-Man to a force for 22 points. But then, Beastman is awesome. Most of the new cards are 1 or 2 points, the most expensive item is the Skull Weapon weighing in at 4 points, which doesn't surprise me because it's really, really good. And that's it, that's the full contents of the box. Not too shabby, I think. Lots of new build options and what seems to be the start of a brand new team construction strategy that focuses on accumulating debuffs. I like how they've picked two characters that complement each other and then added fate and item cards that expand on that synergy. It shows a level of thought that I wasn't really sure I was expecting. But I know you really want to see these miniatures assembled, so let's do that. Here we have our two teleporters. Not a lot to say about these really, you just clip them out of the frame and they're good to go. They're pretty small, they fit exactly in the hexes on the board, and they should paint up really, really easily. I'm thinking I'm just going to do grey, and then I'm going to use Hex Wraith Flame for the swirly bit in the middle. And then we have Scareglow. Scareglow, I've said before, isn't one of my favourite characters from Masters of the Universe. I never even had the toy for this character when I was a child. Furthermore, I'm not entirely sold on the game mechanisms for this character, especially that idea of putting debuffs on your allies. Nevertheless, the miniature itself is really, really nice. Went together very quickly and easily. Not too much in the way of mould lines and very, very few visible join lines. Really, the only visible lines are on the top of his cape on the shoulders. You can see there and there. And as I was filming this, I did notice there is a bit of a mould line on his collar there that I will remove. Overall, excellent miniature that went together very well. And here is Beastman. I really like the pose of this miniature, and Beastman is one of my favourite characters. He also has really good game mechanisms. I really like the idea of him getting stronger as he takes damage, and I can see myself running him in my evil warrior teams, for the foreseeable future at least. There were a few issues with this miniature though in terms of putting it together. First of all, it had some quite prominent mould lines and those mould lines were over fur texture and it's always a bit more of a pain to clean up mould lines on textured surfaces. I'm not the fussiest person in the world when it comes to mould lines in general, but I am being a little bit more particular with my Masters of the Universe miniatures than I normally am. The other concern is a very obvious join line on this side of the miniature that will require some green stuff just to sort that out. Funnily enough, there is no visible join line on the other side where they actually managed to work it into his costume, so I don't know why that join is so obvious there. Nevertheless, a good miniature. And that's it, that's everything from the box. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider pressing the like button. If you've really enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I will see you all again very soon. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye.